paper. It's 11 to 20 on the multiple choice for the 2016 paper. Okay, question 11. Stages of aerobic respiration are shown below. We've got glycolysis, citric acid and electron transfer chain. Which stage involves both phosphorylation of intermediates and generation of ATP. Okay, it's the both that is obviously the most important thing. And all we're looking for here is you recognising this must be glycolysis. Phosphorylation of intermediates is your energy investment stage. Um, and you then get a payoff stage, which means you generate some ATP. Um, so definitely, um, definitely just glycolysis. So definitely one only. So that's E. Um, just to be clear, citric acid cycle, um, you do actually get that one ATP, but you're not using phosphorylation of intermediates during it. And the electron transport chain technically doesn't actually, um, I suppose if we take ATP synthase in there as well. Yes, okay, fair enough. Um, that would be generation of ATP. But yeah, it has to be one. Okay, question 12. Which row in the table below identifies a stage of aerobic respiration at site and events which occur during that stage? Okay, so we've got the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. Okay, so we are looking at you recognising that we have a mitochondria. Dodgy diagram of one coming up. Here we go. Um, so you should know that in here, uh, in the central matrix, this is where we have our um, citric acid cycle. And then it is in the inner membranes here, okay, where we actually get our set electron transport chain going on. Okay, so electron transport chain, inner mitochondrial membrane, I like that. Electron matrix, no. Citric acid, inner mit, nope. And matrix of mitochondria, yes. So A and D still in the running. And the event that we have here, um, so the electron transport chain, carbon dioxide is released, no. We will get um, some water out of that when the hydrogen ions uh, and the energy, the high energy electrons at the end of the transport chain um, combine with oxygen, uh, but we'd already taken out B. And then citric acid cycle doesn't make water, but it does release carbon dioxide. So you would really have to know your stages for that one. It's, it's a reasonably tricky question. Question 13. Field trial was set up to investigate the effect of phosphate fertilizer on the yield of the potato cultivar uh, Maris Piper. Potatoes were planted in five plots, each of which received a different level of phosphate fertilizer. When they were harvested, the yield from each plot was recorded. A list of suggested improvements is shown below. So we've got apply equal volumes of water to each plot, grow the same number of potato plants in each plot, use 10 plots at each phosphate fertilizer level, and plant different potato cultivars in each pot. Which of the suggestions would improve the validity of the results? Okay, so how the validity of the results is basically saying what is a good experimental design. So we are just trying to look at the effect of fertil phosphate fertilizer on yield. Okay, and it has to be the potato cultivar Maris Piper. So why would I use four? That can't be right. I can't use different potato cultivars. Um, and then we're looking for 10 plots at each phosphate fertilizer level. It would actually be a good idea to do it, but that wouldn't increase the validity of the results. It would increase the reliability of the results. Okay, so it's not that. Um, same number of potato plants in each plot. I would definitely need to do that. And equal volumes of water. I would definitely need to do that. So our best answer for this is one and two. Okay. Um, says. Which compound combines with hydrogen during carbon fixation? Right, I've pulled um, a snapshot from the PowerPoint that I have on this one, okay, um, just because it's got everything there. So we're looking for which compound combines with hydrogen. So you need to know this whole cycle. You can't get around it. So often you'll be asked which combines with carbon dioxide and which one combines with um, the hydrogen. So the one that combines with, with the carbon dioxide is your RUBP. Carbon dioxide comes in, unstable intermediate, and then we get our first kind of stable intermediate, which is our 3PG. That then goes on to form our G3P, and that's where we bring in our NADPH and our ATP. So this is where the hydrogen actually gets kind of kicked into the cycle. So it is the 3PG which combines with hydrogen to make G3P. So there's our answer. Okay. 
Okay, question 15. If I can get this to sit properly, maybe not, I'm going to have to go up and down. Okay, the following absorption spectra was obtained by testing four different plant extracts. Which extract contains chlorophyll? Okay, um, so you need to know, as far as chlorophyll is concerned, oh, sorry, um, basically that its absorption spectrum is high at one end and high at the other. Okay, what we're looking at is a high absorption in the red and the blue, but not so much in the green in the middle. So I'm looking for something with high absorption at both ends. And the only one that fits that is D. You're not expected to know this pattern this well, um, just this red blue. Okay. Right, question 17. And I've, again, I've had to move this up to the side, but I've tried to keep the graph as big as I could. Okay, the, the graph below shows the levels of nitrogen and phosphorus applied to crops in an area of Scotland between 1986 and 2006. In which year was the smallest difference between the levels of nitrogen and phosphorus applied? Okay, so the only thing that makes this tricky is the fact that we have a double axis graph with different scales. So the nitrogen is on this scale and the phosphorus is on this scale. So you've just got to do the numbers, okay? So 1998, uh, 2000, 2002, and 2006, okay? So let's just read off the nitrogen first, okay? So uh, 1998, okay? So 1998 is here. Read it across. Uh, what are we going up in? Just going up in ones. So that's 116. And then we have... Uh, 2000 it's got this crossover point here and that's what people will will probably take um, without doing the actual calculation here so that's 112 and then we're dropping down here to 108 and then 2006 is actually reading across 102 okay and then let's just take away our uh, phosphorus Okay, so phosphorus at 1998, reading this way, being very careful. Okay, so this is going up in two states, so that's 42. Okay, um, and this one, which looks like it's the same, but it's not, it's 41. Okay, and then we go down to 40, 2002 and 2006, we are at, we're going 37.5, okay. Um, right, so just punching all the numbers, smallest difference is actually 2006. Okay, so just be really careful that you've read this properly and read both the graphs axes. Okay. Okay, question 19. On returning to their roost after feeding, vampire bats may regurgitate blood to feed an unrelated individual in the same social group. This is an example of, okay, so importantly, unrelated. If they're unrelated, get rid of kin selection, okay, because kin selection has to be between closely related individuals, okay. Um, regurgitating blood to feed someone else means that they are not gaining by it at all, okay, so this is not mutualism, okay. Um, it's in the same social group, so it's not a hierarchy thing. What it is is altruistic, because what's happening is they are harming themselves to benefit someone else. Okay. And lastly on this one, statements below refer to behaviour sometimes displayed by lions kept in captivity. Okay, so we've got uh, repeated chewing on cage bars, excessive licking of body, continually pacing backwards and forwards, okay? So we're looking for um, examples of stereotypy. So these are things which are kind of misdirected behaviour that you would um, not expect them to be doing or misdirected, okay? So repetitive chewing, this is stereotypy, excessive licking, yep, and continually pacing backwards and forwards. All of these are um, examples of this, okay?